because I have a really uh, big passion for um, social inclusion. I've worked in the voluntary sector for some years between I came from academia, went into policy work and uh, lobbying in particular and, and came back into academia. So it's from that perspective that I come from really and um, I would say that what I found myself doing is, is going on a journey to try and find out, quite rightly you're saying that I, I do err on the side of staying in the European Union, but um, I found myself having to defend that position um, and I thought, well, the best way to do that is to get as much information as I can. Now, I have, that's my job, and this has been my job for this evening, and I, I must say I am really quite um, scared by the fact that it was so difficult to answer the question that I set out to answer, um, particularly through the campaign, which I, I will come to, but I want particularly to talk about social inclusion. And social inclusion is very apt because it's very much a European concept which we began to adapt in policy circles in the UK. Um, but it was, first, it was first used um, by the Socialist Party in France, um, but it was a term very much picked up by the European Union in the 90s and then later the Blair government who set up the Social Exclusion Unit in 1997. Um, and... For those of you who don't know, it's, quite, it, it's, it's a term that began to replace poverty as a way of understanding disadvantage, that it's more than just economic, that actually if you suffer from exclusion um, economically, then that's very likely to pour into other areas such as education, such as social networks, um, and so on. So social inclusion is, is a useful concept when it comes to social policy and, and certainly in my work hands-on uh, with people from disadvantage because it is that multi-dimensional um, process that you're thinking about, uh, a lack or denial of resources, rights, goods and services and perhaps most importantly an inability to participate in the normal relationships and activities available to the majority of people and that could be economic, social, cultural or political. Um, but the, the biggest thing about it is it affects the quality of life of individuals because it is so pervasive. Poverty only tells you so much about that experience, whereas social inclusion or social exclusion began to be a term that was much more useful for people who actually wanted to tackle um, you know, ingrained disadvantage, persistent um, exclusion from mainstream society. Um, it, it's a problematic term because it's not easy to solve. If it's just an economic problem, you can just throw money at it. But in terms of social exclusion, it isn't. It crosses all of those lines. So it says, as Tackett says, it's, it's difficult and problematic to identify and describe um, in any definitive term. But nonetheless, what we realise is it is multidimensional. Now, Tackett thinks about three levels, so individual, community and society as a whole as being the three levels of social exclusion, whereas Pearson widens that, um, uh, that definition out. Um, he talks about it not just being something that individuals actually experience, but it's families, groups and neighbourhoods. Um, and, and again, it's about not really being able to participate in, you know, all the activities that make up um, our, our polity, if you like, and our, our society. So in terms of the economic dimension, I should try and get through this very quickly. We're talking about, and so you've got to bear in mind the context in the... 1997, when Blair set this unit out, there was, you know, long-term unemployment, they were thinking about job insecurity, workless households and income poverty, so that, that ingrained economic disadvantage. And then when it came to the social dimension, um, the breakdown, or what was seen as the breakdown of traditional families that led to these other problems, these unwanted teenage pregnancies, crime, disengaged youth, um, homelessness. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, there, there is a theoretical aspect to this, but this was very much taken up by policymakers, I have to say. Um, so politically, we're talking about disempowerment, lack of political rights, low registration of voters, a total disaffection of what, you know, one group of society from the political process. And I've got to say, sitting on the train as I do sometimes, I think 
often that that may not be just about people at the bottom of the socio-economic ladder. Seems to be a great deal of disaffection about politicians all being the same and so on. But, but nonetheless, this is an aspect of social exclusion where people just don't even recognise that it's anything that involves their lives at all. So they don't get involved. They don't affect the political process at all. And then locational neighbourhood, when you're talking about environmental degradation, people living in decaying housing stock and the impact that has on their health, lack of affordable housing, which is the kind of, you know, massively, um, you know, uh, important problem. People like Danny Dawling talking about that. Um, withdrawal of local services, certainly with austerity agenda. There are a lot of services now that did exist that have now been sh shut down, like Shore Start, for instance. And basically a collapse of support networks. I remember working um, in, the, in a project, uh, in a parent participation project, and having to go to a house in an estate, um, and there were four houses blocked up this way and four houses blocked up that way, and this little house in the middle with, with all sorts of rubbish piled in the garden, uh, this oasis, if you like, where this child lived. Now, it's not hard, is it, to imagine that that's a terrible place to live and that you're not likely to have services like shops and places to go and places to play and neighbours to talk to and a network when you live in such a deprived area. That all gets internalised. So we're talking that, you know, if, if you're experiencing all those levels of exclusion, that will inevitably have an impact on your physical and mental health. And I think some figures have come out recently, or research has come out recently, saying that we're now seeing quite a sizable impact on longevity and health, physical health, uh, and at the gap widening between rich and poor. Um, and certainly in somewhere in, in Glasgow, I can't remember the region, um, they have lower life expectancy in that poor deprived area than they do in some parts of North Korea. So, you know, we're talking about it having quite a profound impact on the individual, lack of confidence, low self-esteem, feeling powerless, and so on. So this kind of theory began to um, infect social policy, if you like, and, and it, it did so across the UK, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, all had their own responses um, taking up this idea that actually it's no good just looking at poverty, we need to look at social exclusion. And uh, so the social exclusion uh, unit was set up to look at these problems of, you know, high unemployment, low skills, uh, muck jobs, if you like, uh, low incomes, poor housing, high crime, family breakdown, and so on. So it very much has a, a policy um, basis to it. It's not just a theory. It became very um, ingrained in social policy. Sorry, I, sh I should have to sit on my hands, I think. Um, and, you know, it, it sort of it, it began to appear in all sorts of policy, that, you know, educational policy, social and health policy, and so on. And that was locally, nationally, and regionally up to the European Union. Um, but there is a sort of political side to this, because we're not talking about this has happened by accident. The terminology um, may not always explicitly say this, or may sometimes explicitly say this, but it is seen as a failure on behalf of um, policies to actually reach out to people and include them. So um, it could be that it's the education system that's not accessible and is not promoting social mobility, which we, you know, again, research has shown. Uh, that social mobility is practically dead. Um, the demographic and legal system which promote civil integration, the labour market, um, the welfare state, uh, the family, all of these things are at the root of social exclusion. They're the things that are actually seen to be failing. Um, on the other hand, so that's the sort of policy makers and the theory behind it, there is equally, on the other side, this kind of... Um, almost othering, using, using social exclusion as a way of, of blaming individuals for their own fate. So there have, you know, in terms of public perception, um, the focus on specific households can be linked to labelling or pathologizing. Uh, path, um, Thank you. 
that, that is value laden. This is not a neutral concept. It can often be used to blame people for their own problems, seeing them as failures and seeing them as deviants. So there's sort of two sides to that. Is it the policies that have failed? Is it the governments or governance that's failed? Or is it the individuals that have failed themselves? So that's the kind of, you know, that, that's the world I've been living in both in the voluntary sector and in uh, back in academia now. Um, and so I wanted to apply this lens, if you like, to answer the question of, am I right to think? Because sort of almost instinctively I'm thinking, well, social rights, European Union, these things go together. I'm a woman, maternity leave, and so on. This must be the right thing. I've gained. So uh, this is what I'm going to investigate. And in fact, you know, here we have standing 2010, the European Year for Combating Poverty and Social Exclusion, 2010. Um, and there they identify 84 million Europeans as falling under this umbrella, facing serious obstacles, not being able to get into employment, not getting an education that you, you know, can help them through their lives, uh, not being able to live in decent housing, um, not being able to access all sorts of other services. So uh, the European Union has taken this, you know, it, it is, well, what I wanted to see is what is the European Union? It, what is their approach to dealing with these 84 million people that are deemed to be living a socially excluded life? And they do have some guiding principles, and these, you know, I've highlighted bits, not that they've done, but that are interesting to me. So they recognise the right of those living in poverty and suffering social exclusion to live in dignity and play an active part in society. Um, they see it as a shared responsibility, it's not the individual's fault, a shared responsibility for participation, um, to fight against poverty, and they emphasise both collective and individual action. Um, th they're talking about, they link social inclusion to cohesion, that if we're going to, and particularly important for the European agenda, if you can have a united sense of Europe, if you can have people who relate to Europe with a European identity, I guess they need to feel they're getting something out of it. So that, that you know, they very much link the eradication of poverty and social exclusion with that sense of belonging, with that European citizenship. Um, and so it's very much a political commitment um, that all levels of governance and concrete action need to eradicate poverty and social exclusion across the European space. They talk about social investment in the EU. Now, I'm not saying here, this is lots of, you know, um, political writings, if you like. This is, this is policy documents I've looked at that um, talk about the, the commitment to eradicating social exclusion, the commitment to investing in people and trying to get the best out of people as a way of getting the best out of the European space. Um, actually, how it's translated... Um, it is such a patchwork, often it is devolved down to the nation states themselves to monitor and sort of implement. So of course it's a bit more, it's a bit harder to monitor how it's working when it comes to its implementation. But nonetheless, you know, this is big commitment. Social investment is about investing in people, policies designed to strengthen people's skills and capacities and to support them to participate. Again, that word, key policy areas, education, quality childcare, healthcare, training, job, search, and so on. They also think, like, what we need is a simplified benefit system. Um, and, you know, we want to increase take-up. That is the way to increase take-up. We need to improve the targeting of social policies so that we make sure that we're targeting those most in need. Of course, when it comes to the European space, that may mean it passes over UK borders and goes somewhere else. They're going to target the people most in need. And that's perhaps something which a lot of, uh, certainly maybe the ant campaign, would not see as a benefit for the UK uh, to actually be looking at solving uh, social exclusion across the European space. Um, they are also a pursuer of social rights in terms of employment rights. Um, I kind of believe in workers' rights. I'm a bit old-fashioned like that. Right to some sort of modicum of pay. Um, rights to, uh, you know, un you're not 
being unfairly dismissed and so on. But here is the European Union saying this is what it aims to establish, all of those rights, access to lifelong learning, massively important if you're talking about a global economy that needs to constantly be engaging in IT and all the, you know, kind of new challenges that globalisation throws at us, you know. All of those things are, are, are massively important, not just in terms of uh, individual rights, but in terms of having an economy that is going to be globally competitive. So all of those things, you can read them, access to basic social services and so on, again, is something that the, so, uh, the European Union has a commitment to. Um, and the president of the European Commission um, backs this up by saying this is a really good thing to do. Right? This is not just about lefty pinko commies, this is not just about political agendas. This is because, he says, those European countries with the most effective social protection systems, and perhaps we're thinking about the northern European countries, with the most developed social partnerships, that are among, they are the among, most successful and competitive economies in the world. So he's making the case that this makes business sense. You know, the more people you have included in your society, having some modicum of prosperity, the better it is overall for the economy, not just for that sense of social cohesion and becoming a European citizen, but it is, you know, the best thing for competitive economies. But there has been um, always perhaps this tension between the kind of single market and the, the kind of movement there to integrate the economies and free up, you know, the kind of movement of, of monies and, and all that kind of thing, that sort of impetus, versus the positive integration of the EU perhaps taking up a, a more prominent role in developing social policy that is pan-European, not just leaving it, devolving it to the nation states, but actually having a greater role in trying to drive forward some of those visions. Um, but so a lot of um, European integration theorists think that there is a real tension there, that you know, the single market is pulling one way, and the, the positive integration, the, the supranationalists who would like to see the European Union play a bigger role, particularly in generating social policy, pulling in the other direction. Um, the argument is, though, that you know, it, 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 if we're facing similar problems, so the UK, Germany, Spain, we're all facing an ageing population. We're all facing a global economy where businesses can up and move to somewhere in the developing world because they have workers there that work for much less and don't have those sorts of constraints. So we're all facing those problems. So arguably, um, wouldn't it be a more effective solution if we tried to find solutions, harness good practice, whatever else it is, at that European level? Um, Habermas goes on to say that actually this, you know, having more direct um, European social policy, having that kind of um, more impetus to try and redistribute wealth and tackle poverty and social exclusion, that's social Europe, would develop a more um, a common political identity. So he thinks that's the very thing that would underpin that European citizenship. Until we have that positive integration, that supranational response to some of these problems that we all face, uh, we're not going to have this share this sense of European citizenship. So he sees it very much as a good thing. So that's the sort of social exclusion, the theory, the aspirations in terms of European Union. What I want to now think about is, well, what do people think of that? What about the people living in that space? How do they see it? Um, and this was taken from the Eurobarometer number 355. They, they probably need to come up with some more catchy names, don't they, if they're going to get people to read them. Um, but um, this was gauging public perceptions on who should tackle social exclusion, who should tackle poverty. Um, as you, I've le left out the religious institutions, partially because it took me about five hours to actually 
make this bar chart, I'm very, oh, this, this chart. I'm very proud of myself in the end. I did manage to do it, but um, I wanted to simplify it. But, um, and mostly because I just wanted to highlight the kind of different um, areas here. Now, this is the population they've asked, uh, you know, the good range of citizens across all the member states. So this is the kind of amalgam of, of European responses, and we will dig down to some of the individual nation states in a minute. But you can see, while it's a bit scary, I think, that most people, it seems, the vast majority of people, don't actually trust national governments to solve the problem of poverty, to tackle social exclusion. Um, a sizable amount of people think it's actually NGOs or charities that actually should be doing that work. Um, citizens themselves, um, and then it sort of evens out. Local authorities have a role, that's about even. Um, and the EU is quite high up there in terms of, well, it's sort of even, I guess, 50-50, whether they trust the EU to do it or not. So that's pan-Europe. Um, then you look at national differences, and you very much, then you can see, of course, where the UK is. I find Sweden very, very sweet. It, it likes everything. Everything can solve it. It's, it's, it's positive about everything. Yes, charities, yeah, private business, yeah, governments, they all need to be involved. But if you see the UK, um, it is, of course, you can see they're very much on the lower end of that scale. Um, they're very, very much not looking to the European Union to solve those problems. And in fact, the biggest uh, section of people are saying that actually it should be left to the charity sector. That's the sector that should be solving this problem and citizens themselves. Um, and governments feature very low down on there. Personally, I find that a bit scary. I kind of wonder if I've woken up in Charles Dickens where um, it's, it's less to, left to kind of good deeds to actually solve these problems and not governments at all. Um, so what should national government do to combat policy? So again, this is the pan-European responses. 60% um, of people saying, well, we just need, we need more work opportunities. That's what needs to happen. Um, and then kind of, you know, there's a little bit of, well, economic growth, training, um, affordable housing. Um, and about 30% of people across uh, Europe actually think you need to increase benefits. But then we look at the UK. Maybe not surprisingly, um, we will read the papers, watch the news. Increasing benefits is seen as a very bad idea. Um, mostly, uh, they seek the, the end of poverty through work opportunities and training. Um, affordable housing is up there, but I find that quite interesting, that increasing benefits, increasing the money you give to people um, who are living at that poor end is actually not a very popular idea in the UK. So you can see there are some tensions with, you know, what other perhaps pan-European responses versus what the UK response is. And I'm not here to try and understand that, that um, attitude change particularly, but it is quite interesting. It's maybe not surprising um, that even though I come out saying, yes, I think we should still stay, stay in the EU, I'm very much worried that a lot of people will not and will end up coming out just because of those you know, very different responses. Um, so there are some policy directives, and I, you probably know all these, so I'm not going to labour the point, like the European Social Fund. That's one of the areas where social, you know, social policy is being driven, that commitment to try and you know, encourage that job growth, encourage that sustainable development to tackle some of those problems. Um, and it says in areas of the greatest need. So again, that might not be something we see everywhere in the UK. It may be sort of very few areas that we attract that kind of funding, but it's looking at areas that are less developed, industrial decline, long-term unemployment, and so on. Um, but looking forward, what it very much has done is responded to that agenda about people thinking, yes, what we need is more jobs. We need to get people into jobs. And so a lot of what the European Social Fund is going to do now is to try and harmonise that, try and particularly look at young people, um, try and harmonise the, the administrative and governance side of things, so particularly the, the, the newest members so that they're actually able to administer this support most effectively. 
Um, but social inclusion appears again to finance many thousands of projects that help people in difficulty and those from disadvantaged groups to get skills and jobs and have the same opportunities as, other, as others do. So social exclusion is still in there. And there is, you know, some figures here about how much they'll invest over seven years, 80 billion um, euros, with at least 20% of that going to support projects that enhance social inclusion. Um, there's also this cohesion policy, and again, it's interesting because it's the social uh, uh, aspects of that that are seen as being the most important to cohesion in the European Union. Um, and addressing social and economic inequalities, um, they do very much say these are political goals. They're, they're out to try and develop social justice and redistribute funds, particularly um, you know, around those areas that suffer from those you know, industrial decline and so on. Um, this became a particular sort of political football when Spain and Portugal joined in 1985, when it doubled the population of people who were living in those poorer areas. So of course that, if for, for people who were worried about um, more money going um, into the European Union from UK uh, budgets um, than were actually receiving from it, uh, receiving it, this would be a no particular concern to you because um, they do say in the out campaign actually that it's uh, 350 million pounds we give a week to the European Union, whereas actually after the rebate. Um, which, well, I say after the rebate, it's applied before we give it. So we actually just, we do give 250 million. Um, so we get probably about, out of our 13 billion that we give annually, we get about 4.5 billion back. So our net contribution is 8 billion pounds. Now that's horrible if you think the European project is, you know, a bad thing. If you think that we don't get anything out of it, if you're not particularly bothered about social exclusion or about creating a European space, um, that, let's face it, is a bit of a risk where eventually you tackle social exclusion and what you do is actually enhance the wealth and happiness of the people in that area and that perhaps will have a knock-on effect on the economy. So that is a bit of a risk because we are a net contributor. But then there are other things we need to think about. Um, and this is what's frustrated me about this research is largely what I'm finding out is debate about the economy, um, whether it's, you know, how much as a family, per family, we're going to lose if we come out, how much we'll lose if we stay in. Um, not, not being an economist, that, that makes my head fall off usually. So I'm sticking to what I know. So I, the second thing I need to think about is sustainability then, because that's something that I very much care about as well. Um, and that is one of my um, you know, reasons why I think perhaps being part of the European Union would be much more helpful to us, because as a little nation, um, I can't see how we can solve problems such as um, global warming and, um, you know, participate quite so well in a, in a global economy and so on. So um, sustainability is another kind of area that I, I wanted to think about. Um, and from the point of view of sustainable societies, I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, not burning greenhouse gases, at, well, you know, that's massively important. And I know the World Health Organization has said that climate change is going to be the biggest um, killer of people eventually because of the pollution and because of the impact that's going to have on our health. Um, so uh, I am, you know, of course they're sort of in, interlinked, but I'm much more caring about a society that's well balanced, um, one where we're actually using our resources wisely, but also fairly. Um, I, I can't live in a world very well. I get very cross every time I read that 60 people own half of the wealth of the world. Now, you know, even if I wasn't a lefty pinko commie, and I am, um, I would find that very difficult from the point of view of sustainability. So we have got enough resources, we just choose not to distribute those more wisely. We choose to push them all at one end. Um, so that, that is something that concerns me. So the EU in terms of uh, sustainability has the uh, seventh environmental action programme. I don't know what happened to one to six, but 
This is their latest projection that actually we're looking forward to 2050, where they would like people to live well within the planet's ecological limits. Our prospects, probably a good job, isn't it, that um, Donald Trump isn't in this room as we speak, because I remember seeing that bit about him trying to convince people that if he sprayed hairspray or whatever that is on his head, that um, actually uh, he lives in a, a, a self-contained flat with hermetically sealed windows and how possibly can that contribute to climate change. I did find that quite funny, really. But uh, So I'm sure you wouldn't agree with this, but how can we live within the planet's ecological limits? Um, because our prosperity and healthy environment stem from an innovative but a circular economy where we're not actually constantly buying new things and throwing the old ones away. Well, we actually, I don't know if you've heard about this, there was a, um, there's a bit of work going on in this university about this too, about actually um, selling a service rather than a product. So what I buy is a car. That, that, sorry, what I buy is not a car, I buy transport. And as long as that transport gets me from A to B, I've got my service. What I'm not buying is a car, which then I want the next car because they've already changed the, the stereo or they've changed the air lock uh, brake system or whatever else it is because I need the next new um, product. So the circular economy, so it's interesting, we're looking forward to an economy where perhaps we base what we buy and, and uh, what we use from a very different premise. So nothing is wasted. Where natural resources are managed sustainably and biodiversity is protected, valued, and restored. So um, it's got this great commitment in 2050 to doing this. And it, it comes up with these key objectives about, and I, I'm being cynical because, you know, it's actually implementing this that I find in the current e EU is going to be quite difficult. So they're talking about um, protecting people from these environmental problems. Um, they're talking about better implementation of policy, wiser investment, um, integration of environmental policies with other policies. But actually, there is the catch out at the end. The programme entered into force in January 2014. It's now up to the EU institutes and the member states to ensure it's implemented and the priority objectives set out and are met by 2020. So if I, I feel let down by the EU, it's maybe for a very different reason for other people. It's because I think they don't go far enough. I don't think they think, you know, it's okay coming up with a policy that can only work at a supranational level, but if then you've got no means to implement that, then you're kind of left in no man's land. Um, I'm aware we're running out of time, and I did want to, um, so I'm going to whiz out there. I'm going to get to the crime scene, so in or out, in terms of social inclusion, in terms of that agenda, this is my agenda, this is my personal sort of mission, um, so this is the sort of measure that I'm using. But I do find the campaign is very economic-centric. A lot of the things that you hear about how much money we're going to win or lose, this theoretical average financial cost to each family of leaving or staying. As an in-person, I'm very disappointed they're not playing the social card, the sustainability card. I'm very disappointed that political integration is seen as something that's very, very negative, that, that gaining employment rights or maternity rights is not... <coughs> The thing that you're seeing um, headline their campaign, it's very much, um, you know, focusing on the economy. Um, very little mention of, I haven't heard anything about globalisation or sustainable society. Some mention of gender equality, and I'll come to that because that's in the in campaign. But very strong themes of identity and otherness. We're this, we're British, we're not that. Uh, there's something else. And a little bit of social justice, um, but, but not very much. And I, 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 there's a long quote in here that you probably had some intersection with from me and Duncan Smith. Um, I, it was a good job I was sitting down and I read it because apparently the European Union is the cause of all the inequalities in our society and that did shock me somewhat. Um, anyway, the Leave campaign is very much about the economy and security. 
Um, it's about border control. It's about, you know, uh, we, get, we cannot support migration at the rate we've got it at. Schools are, you know, bursting. National Health Service is bursting. Um, there was something I read about the Olympic Village being dominated by Eastern Europeans who worked and lived in, you know, lived in bed sits, kept their costs down and took all the jobs at a lower rate and therefore there were no jobs for British people and so on. So it's that kind of thing that I've, I've been picking up. Uh, the membership fee they do mention, the democratic deficit of the EU, that we don't elect, there's lots of unelected representatives who are making these policies um, and we have no say in that. Um, and being British, and I, I, I found this quite fascinating. Um, oh. I'm not registered to open the site, so there you go. Well, perhaps you could look at it yourself. It's on the, it's on the Leave campaign, and there's a little um, kind of YouTube clip, and it's showing us Sir Isaac Newton and um, Florence Nightingale and uh, Winston Churchill, and to say that you know we've had all of these wonderful, you know, these amazing British people who have been world changers. And therefore, that is the reason why we should believe that Britain can solve all its own problems. It needs to be independent. So it is, again, I mean, you know, it, 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 that might be quite appealing to some people, but it is interesting that that is the kind of level of debate. It's about we were, we were an empire once, so therefore we need to sort of hang on to these ideas that we have great people. You know, all of the people that have done other things across the globe are not mentioned, the people who weren't British but it's this sense of being British. Um, and uh, social justice just came in at the last minute, a couple of weeks or a week ago, uh, where Ian Duncan Smith starts to say that um, basically the Euro European Union is bad for social justice and inclusion because it has a terrible impact on poorer people. Um, particularly semi-skilled and unskilled people who are being driven out of the, the work market. Um, and he goes on to say that if we're not careful, we're gonna see an explosion of have-nots. Um, I would love to find the piece of research that showed how much that was to do with the changes he made to benefits and how much that has anything to do with the European Union at all. But there you go. That, that, is, that is, you can see I am being very biased now. Aren't I? Um, the Strong Green campaign, again, it's still dominated by the economy. It's been drawn into that debate about how much per family is going to lose if blah, 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 blah. It does talk about jobs, it, it similarly talks about security, but it, it's almost like, you know, there's, there's a table tennis game going and it's batting backwards and forwards, but I'm not learning anything, particularly about the mechanisms. When you're saying this, why are you saying that? I'm not learning about the policies that have led to that. It's just a game of sort of political football. A strong Green campaign have talked about travel, you know, it's easier to travel, and about gender equality. And there is something about gender mainstreaming that appears on their site. I don't know if I can, I'm registered to play this. Let's see. Las mujeres somos el 52% de la población de Europa, por lo tanto todas las políticas eh, dirigidas a eliminar las desigualdades estructurales, a eliminar las eh, diferencias eh, entre hombres y mujeres es algo fundamental en todos los ámbitos. Eh, la Comisión de las Mujeres en el Parlamento Europeo tiene que tener una total coordinación con el resto de comisiones eh, para conseguir que el gender mainstreaming sea, sea una realidad. Cuestiones como es la lucha contra el desempleo en la Unión Europea que afecta gravemente a las mujeres. Eh, cuestiones como la brecha salarial. Hoy las mujeres europeas tienen que trabajar una media eh, de 35 días más que los hombres al año para cobrar un mismo salario. Eh, cuestiones como la lucha contra la violencia de género, la mayor lacra social que tenemos en estos momentos, en el mundo y en Europa también, mujeres que son asesinadas en manos de sus parejas por el mero hecho de, de ser mujer. 
eh, cuestiones eh, como la eh, posibilidad de que todas las políticas incorporen esta dimensión de género, la política exterior, la política económica, la política social, la política de cohesión, la necesidad de retomar iniciativas como es eh, la directiva del permiso de maternidad, eh, como es eh, cuestiones relativas también a la participación de las mujeres en la toma de decisiones económicas, de su participación en los consejos de administración. Europa no será la Europa eh, de los ciudadanos y las ciudadanas si no necesitamos incorporar el principio de igualdad en las políticas del día a día. So, women's rights are coming out in the Stronger In campaign, if you look at the website. But the thing is, I, I don't know how many of you are, and it'd be nice to sort of hear that. When you look at the website, so I don't know about you, I'm just deeply disappointed. They're not engaging in any debate particularly. To me, it seems like it's preaching to the converted. So you're going to click on the In campaign if you're an In person. You're going to click on the Leave campaign if you're a Leave person. There's not really much there to help you pick through um, how, how can we really assess whether the European Union um, you know, should be about social rights, should be about social inclusion, should muddy its hands in that kind of area? Should it be, uh, should we be talking about whether we will be able to um, address some of the processes of globalization, um, some of the challenges that give us if we become a kind of nation state, an isolated nation state again? It, that, you know, I'm, I'm puzzled as to why those kind of um, ideas and debates are, aren't there. It's a very sort of bland, two-dimensional kind of campaign, it seems to me. Um, and equally, sorry, disability rights was also something that's been championed by uh, the European Union. So there are sort of, you know, to me, there is some really good uh, policy debates, there's some policy ideas that I could really support and get behind because... Um, I believe in sustainability and social inclusion. Um, but to me, the reason why we're not achieving them is because we haven't got enough European integration, not too little. Um, so my, these are my conclusions, and they're very kind of back of the fag packet, the best I could do because uh, um, you probably need about 10 years to study this and study the, the maths. And as I said, I'm definitely no European integration expert. I am just about social inclusion. Um, the emphasis on the campaign is on the economic and verging towards national identity, which in my opinion enhances this individualism, um, you know, this sense of we're responsible for ourselves and we don't want a government to, to meddle with that. Um, and the othering of, you know, migrants swarming into our country, taking our jobs, taking our houses, um, and so on. So they're, they're, that I see very much, uh, you know, kind of the ideas of both in and out around those ideas. The debate is based on um, some, you know, threats. I don't mean kind of why you little, I mean, you know, seeing the European Union as presenting either more threats to being British or threats to our way of life or threats to our economy, um, that rather than seeing, so it's about being British rather than living in the UK in a post-industrial society, in a global society. So um, it's almost like it's going backwards. I am a bit of a postmodernist um, on the side and it's kind of almost tribal. We're going into that kind of territory. Um, as if we can sort of button up the hatches and the rest of the world will just fly by somehow. Um, issues such as social rights, sustainability and global governance haven't really appeared as far as I could see. Um, if globalisation is mentioned, it's all around the global economy. And on balance, I think the EU has done a lot in terms of pushing social rights, pushing the agenda, changing the terminology, uh, moving us towards thinking about um, poverty as not being the, the, um, the, the sole problem of people who are marginalised. Um, and that actually there are social and political processes that actually lead to that. So as far as my voting goes, unless something radical happens, I'm afraid in terms of Eurovision, it's EU D point and the campaign nil point. So thank you very much. Thank you.